afternoon, everyone. We are just going to pause a moment to give everyone a chance to get online with us, but we're delighted to have all of you here. All right, good afternoon uh, and welcome to Exploring Indigeneity, Native Expression and Identity. I'm Sarah Curitan, Executive Director of the New Jersey Historical Commission, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. This is the second in a series of webinars we're offering this year as we explore the history of indigenous tribes and individuals in what we now know as New Jersey. I'd like to begin our program with the following acknowledgement. With gratitude, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional homelands of the Lenape people called Lenape Hoking. The Lenape are the original people of this land and we acknowledge their continuing relationship with their territory. A legacy of colonialism, violence, displacement, migration and settlement has shaped the region we now call New Jersey, impacting generations up to the present day. Still, nations, communities, families, and individuals persist in sustaining oral and cultural tradition and maintain a strong connection to this land and its waterways. This statement represents a commitment to beginning the ongoing process of relationship building with tribal nations both in and outside of the state's colonized borders and learning how we can, through respect and connection, support a truthful and inclusive understanding of indigenous history and contemporary life. Now, exploring indigeneity, native identity and expression is the second in a series of webinars called New Jersey's Indigenous Voices. Programs in 2021 were developed in partnership with a planning committee, co-chaired by Dr. Jameson Sweet, Assistant Professor of American Studies at Rutgers University, and Claire Garland, Executive Director of the Sand Hill Indian Historical Association and the New Jersey Commission on American Indian Affairs. And I wanna add a special thanks here. Uh, to the commission members and staff, including Rowena Madden, Michelle Perez, and Vinnie Finellis. A second thank you goes to the New Jersey Council for the Humanities for supporting this webinar series. And I have to include a deep thanks to the staff of the New Jersey Historical Commission, especially Greer Luce, who's been spearheading this series and these programs this year, and to Noelle Lorraine Williams, who is our webmaster for this afternoon. And now I'd like to introduce Stephen Burton, chair of the New Jersey Commission on American Indian Affairs to offer introductory remarks. Steve, I think you might be uh, muted there. Okay, we can hear now, right? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, anyway, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to apologize in advance for a little bit of a rough throat, but it's all good, uh, just from a minor re, uh, recovery from an illness, we're doing good. Um, but anyway, I wanted to welcome everybody to uh, uh, the symposium. Uh, this is a very important thing. Um, my name is Steve Burton, um, and I wanted to give you a little bit of information about who I am for you guys. I am um, um, the commission, one of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. I'm a member of the Ramapo Nation, and um, 
could I give you a little bit of information about me uh, and, and why this uh, symposium is important. Um, uh, me growing up as a kid, uh, my parents got divorced when I was very young. I grew up with my grandparents. And uh, at the time, I didn't know who or what I was at the time because uh, my grandparents were old school. Uh, I always knew I was something different uh, just because of some of my friends going to your friends' houses for dinner and talking to them and things. And uh, the way they, anyway, uh, the way that family interacted was much different than the way our family interacted. So I kind of, you know, kind of, kind of figured out there was something different there. I just didn't know what, um, uh, uh, how I found out was later on in life. Uh, I joined the service, did my time, came back. My my uh, my grandmother passed away uh, not too much longer after I got out, and uh, at the funeral, my grand my uh, father said to me, uh, looking at my grandmother, saying, look at that Indian nose. And I kind of lit up like, what? What was that all about? Oh, you, you never knew? No, I didn't know that we were Native American, which I thought was very interesting. And um, it turns out that my grandparents were old school. And uh, when they were growing up, they had to kind of hide their identity uh, from who or what they were. Uh, so it just kind of carried it on in life. And my grandparents never told me anything about it. So I started, that started my journey, which has been well over 20 years to discover you know, my family, who we are and all those things. And, uh, you know, uh, seeing uh, how much information is, is lacking here in New Jersey, as far as Native Americans in New Jersey, uh, we didn't learn anything in school about any of the wars that were here, the Peach War, the Whiskey War, the Beaver Wars, uh, Kiev's War, None of that stuff was mentioned in school. Um, so at the behest of one of my family members who was on the commission, uh, I decided to request myself to be on the commission to see what I could do to kind of rectify that. Because there's so much information that's uh, missing. And I'm sure I'm not the only person, Native American here in New Jersey, who doesn't know much about their past. Uh, uh, so um, that's what made me join. Uh, so since that time, I've studied many things. I've found many, many books, uh, historical books, uh, started an online library, started uh, interacting with others, uh, other indigenous from other states, and uh, learned a lot. But there's so much more to learn. So it all begins with uh, like this symposium where we can all talk and share information and, um, you know, and, and get the education out there and get people to know who and what we are. And um, I really, really appreciate that you guys took time out of your day to, uh, to learn about these things and talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Burton. It's wonderful to have you with us today. And now we have a fascinating panel of speakers ready to share their work with you on topics exploring different aspects of indigeneity particularly approaches to indigenous identity and cultural expression. Now, just a couple of quick reminders. Please do remember to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the program. We will have a limited amount of time to answer questions at the end of the webinar and may not be able to address every question. The webinar, however, will be recorded and shared via YouTube following today's event. And now I'm just delighted to introduce our moderator for today. Trinity Norwood is a citizen of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation in South Jersey. She serves her people as the head coordinator for the Tribal Royalty Program. As an advocate for indigenous peoples, Trinity works to promote and educate about indigenous issues through multiple mediums including art, film, and literature. She's been featured in, on Comcast Newsmakers and interviewed by Kathy O'Connell for the WXPN Kids Corner. As a writer, Trinity creates poetry and short stories that focus on her experience of being a Lenape woman. Some of her pieces have been published in the Voices Poetry Anthology Collection and used for local art projects like the Ghost Ship Exhibit at Race Street Pier. She's also appeared in local historical documentaries like the Philadelphia English teacher to speak to her classroom for American Indian History Month. That experience inspired her 
to found Native New Jersey, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness, dispelling stereotypes and misconceptions about Native people, and educating other organizations about Native history, culture, and current events. She hopes to grow local awareness about Indigenous history and the current issues being faced by Indigenous peoples from all over the country. So Trinity, the stage is yours. Mishi, thank you. Well, I have the honor of introducing our amazing panelists. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Maria Josefina Saldana Portillo, a professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis Department and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at NYU. Her book, Indian Given, Racial Geographies Across Mexico and the United States, received the 2019 Casa de las Americans Literary Prize in Latino Studies, the 2017 ASA John Hope Franklin Book Prize, and the 2017 NACCS Book Award. With over 30 articles in English and Spanish on revolution, subaltern politics, indigenous peoples, racial formation, migration, narco-economics, and Latin American and Latinx cultural studies. Her most recent include, Indians have always been modern, Roma, the settled colonial paradigm, and Latinx temporality, which rethinks decoloniz decolonizationism from a Latin American perspective, and the violence of citizenship in the making of refugees, the US and Central America which explores the integral role gendered labor and violence play in the drug economy. She is chairwoman of the Coalition Mexicana, an immigrants rights organization and an expert witness for Central American asylum cases with legal aid agencies internationally. Thank you so much, Trinity. Should I just begin? I would like to begin by thanking the Lenape Hoke for hosting us on their traditional lands today, the New Jersey Historical Commission for organizing this event, and especially Greece, Greer Luce for inviting me. I've been asked to speak to you about the impact of indigenous Latin American migration to the United States but to understand the reasons for indigenous migration, a thumbnail history of Mexican indigenous state relations is necessary. As some of you may already know, Mexico had the first socialist revolution in the world in 1910. But because of Eurocentrism and the revolution's peasant origins, it's not largely, it's rarely recognized as such. The Mexican Revolution was a rural one, led by armies of dispossessed indigenous peoples organized under Emiliano Zapata in the south and Pancho Villa in the north. Contrary to the British crown or US colonialism, the Spanish crown recognized indigenous communal land holdings and provided royal titles for their territories. The crown was not involved in the day-to-day -day governance of these communities. They left this to the communities themselves and to the Catholic Church. As long as indigenous communities paid their taxes and tithes in labor, coin, or kind, the crown did not concern itself with the internal governance of the indigenous republic, as it was then called. It is for the same reason, the collection of taxes and tithes, that indigenous lands were protected by the crown. When independence happened in 1910, with its liberal ideal of private property, indigenous peoples were massively dispossessed with huge haciendas emerging that exploited the labor of the dispossessed for the production of a host of globally traded products. Just to put things in perspective, during the 19th century, that is between the 1810 War of Independence from Spain and the 1910 Revolution, Mexico's indigenous population was reduced to less than 1% of the arable lands and forests. The 1910 revolution was a triumph for indigenous people as agrarian reform restored their lands. Even today, almost 30 years after the passage of the North American Free Trade Accord, NAFTA, with its incentives for privatizing communal indigenous lands, 
53% of the arable land in Mexico are communally owned by indigenous people, as well as 26% of the forest's areas. Just pause and think about that for a moment. More than half of the arable territory is in the hands of indigenous peoples. The revolution also instituted the twin pillars of mestizaje and indigenismo as part of its nationalist vision. In Mexico, there isn't a white-black di racial dichotomy as there is here. Rather, there is a mestizo-indigenous dichotomy, though this is an imperfect analogy as indigenous peoples are considered the origin of the Mexican nation, and that symbolism is quite powerful. While indigenismo stemmed from a patronizing attitude for indigenous peoples by mestizos, it also entailed a number of policies that greatly benefited indigenous peoples beyond agrarian reform, including subsidizing their agricultural production with price controls, lo loans, and support for multi-tiered indigenous cooperatives. In 1994, the year that NAFTA was signed, indigenous farmers supplied Mexico with 70% of the nation's corn because of these favorable policy. NAFTA eliminated subsidies for all kinds of Mexican farmers and opened the border to Canadian and US basic grains. With the elimination of price supports and other subsidies, indigenous farmers simply couldn't compete with industrially produced corn and other foodstuffs. Today, in a supremely ironic turn, Mexico, where the cultivation of corn began, now imports 70% of its maize. Since 1994, we have seen a huge influx of indigenous peoples to the United States because of this devastation. Mestizaje, the privileging of mestizos over indigenous peoples, names a political economy of indigenous extraction and appropriation for Mexican nationalism in a myriad of ways, but today I'm only going to address those that affect immigration to the U.S. Mestizaje structures the labor market in ways that directly benefit the U.S. by cheapening the extraction of indigenous labor from, in, of labor from indigenous populations. Lack of Spanish language fluency, for example, is a barrier to knowledge about labor rights in Mexico and the United States. For the last 30 years, indigenous men and women have been recruited by labor contractors from their communal farms in Puebla and Oaxaca to come work as crop hands all over the United States, including the Northeast. Half of the nation's crop hands are undocumented, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture statistics. There's nothing novel in pointing out that our agricultural production depends on a hyper-exploited, undocumented labor force to provide cheap foodstuffs that we enjoy, even as the pandemic allows us to recognize this population as essential. However, the percentage of indigenous undocumented migrants has greatly increased, as indigenous farmers were pushed off their communal farms by 1990 neoliberal reforms and by contemporary climate change. Indigenous migrants also find work in urban restaurants and grocery stores all over the Northeast as part of the, a part of the low wage service economy that makes up the racial geography of our cities. Research among Oaxacan, Mixtec and Zapotec migrant workers highlights the role mestizaje plays in segmenting the labor force, especially when we recognize that mestizaje is not only miscegenation, but also acculturation to mestizos norms. The lack of Spanish literacy is the determining factor in channeling Mixtec migrants into the hyper-exploitative agricultural sector in the United States, while Zapotec migrants, who generally are Spanish literate because of their work in Oaxaca's tourist industry, find work in the less exploitative urban sector of major U.S. cities. Even within these sectors, however, discriminatory treatment and pay differentials exist between indigenous and mestizo workers. <clears throat> Zapotecs who landed jobs in California restaurants uh, and, for example, reported that speaking Zapotec created tensions between themselves and non-Indigenous workers, causing Zapotecs to deny their ethnicity due to fear of discrimination. Language barriers and ethnic shaming combine with undocumented status to uh, create a hyper-exploitable Indigenous laboring class. The militarization of the border ended interval migration, making indigenous Mexicans a permanent part of Latinx and Latin American populations in the US. 
whereas the ease of crossing the border had allowed immigrants to return to their families in between work cycles, border militarization makes it nearly impossible to cross now and encourages immigrants to bring their families or raise new families here, staying indefinitely. Consequently, Native American populations in the United States grew by 21% in the 1990s. In California, the indigenous peoples grew by 146%. The 2000, in the 2000 census, 400,000 Latinx chose American Indian or Alaskan Native as their only ethnic or racial identification. By 2010, that number increased to over 400 and I'm sorry, 685,000. While this represents less than a one per, less than one percent of the 50 million people who identify as Latinx, it nevertheless represents a greater than 50 percent increase in Latinx folks identifying as indigenous over the course of just 10 years. The census asks for tribal affiliation. However, tribe is not a category that exists in Latin America. Nevertheless, the many indigenous who did put down an identification, put down Mayan, Mixtec, Zapotec, Triqui, and Purepeche, thus indicating that they are primarily from Mexico and Guatemala. It's here that we can locate what escapes mestizaje's extractive logic. As a discourse for producing national unity and managing indigenous life in Mexico, mestizaje provided the contradictory terms for indigenous inclusion in the nation. The Indian as origin story of mestizaje provided Pan American indigenous movements and peoples with the discursive possibility of claiming their pre-colonial belonging within the nation, even if this required a certain folklorization of their cultures. It's precisely this discursive possibility that the Zapatistas seized upon in 1994 when they reclaimed Mexico for themselves with their slogan, Todos Somos Indios, We Are All Indians. If dead Indians were the folkloric or origins of the Mexican nation, then living indigenous peoples continuously decolonize this discursive ground by insisting on authoring their own and the nation's destiny. By claiming American Indian on the US census, these new indigenous immigrants stretch the meaning of the term Indian, imbuing it with unintended content. By choosing American Indian on the US census, they unmoor their indigenous attachments to Mexico, Guatemala, or Peru, but also unmoor American Indian from its original bureaucratic intent. They have no tribal recognition from the US government after all, but they reiterate their indigenous priority, this time attaching it to US nationalism. By insisting on the indigenous identity, on their indigenous identity within the US, they are claiming, I would argue, a prior continental belonging, a transcolonial belonging, if you will, that traverses the time and space of competing nationalisms across the American continent. I would like to give one extended example of this transcolonial indigenous belonging and priority that expresses itself in the United States today. Let me start my screen share. From May through November every year, Zapotec and Mixtec communities across California host Gala Getza celebrations. In Los Angeles, Gala Getza events last an entire month, complete with a basketball tournament, a Miss Oaxaca beauty pageant, and an indigenous film and literature festival. Oh, sorry, that went too fast. There we go. These California gay laguetzas reiterate the Oaxacan gay laguetza, an international tourist attraction responsible for a sizable chunk of Oaxaca's annual GDP. The principal event at the Oaxacan gay laguetza is a day of dance and performances by 16 different indigenous pueblos performing their traditional dances from their region in their trajes, their traditional clothing seen here. At the end of each dance, the dancers customarily gift particular, the particular products their indigenous region is flame, famous for, pineapples, chocolate, peanuts, or gourds, by flinging these gifts into the audience, and you better duck or catch. The Oaxacan Gay Laguetza is a textbook product of Indianista policies instituted by Mexico's revolutionary government. Andres Enestroso Morales was a Zapotec cultural critic and public intellectual who explained in one of his many treatises that Gay Laguetza, quote, 
is an erroneous transcription of the Zapotec word for Gwendalisa, meaning kinship and proximity, end quote. The suffix sa in Zapotec means essence, the Swendalisa means that kinship and relationality are the essence of Zapotec being. As a ritual celebration of dance and feasting, Gwendalisa symbolizes belonging to community, but also the aid that Zapotecs offer each other freely at moments of great importance like birth, death, and marriage. Gift giving during the, Gay Laget, during the Gwendalisa is a representation of aid given without the expectation of reciprocity. The mistranscription, this slippage from the Zapotec Guendalisa to the Spanish Gay Laguetza, allows us to trace not simply Zapotec history of colonization and survivance, it also offers us another example of Zapotec transcolonial longing and priority. The Aztecs first formalized the Guendalisa in honor of Sente Oru, the Aztec goddess of corn, fixing the date of what were multiple Zapotec festivals to one day in July. The Aztecs strategically celebrated Guendalisa atop Sierra del Fortín, Fort Hill, where they had placed their garrison to maintain imperial control over the Oaxacan Valley below with its Zapotec and Mixtec inhabitants. Today, the Gay Laguetza is still held atop Fortín Hill in July. Imperial Aztecs, in other words, grafted their celebration of Sental Otl, goddess of corn, over Zapotec and Mixtec celebrations of multiple gods, including Cosijo, the god of corn, and Pitao Cocobi, the god of grain fields. When the Spaniards displaced the Aztecs, the Aztecs as imperial overlords, they transformed the celebration of Sental Otl into the celebration of the Virgen del Carmen. It is, in fact, this date set by the Aztecs for the Zapotec celebration of Guendalisa that set the date for Carmen's official saint day as July 16th in the Catholic calendar. It's the old Spanish scripturu atop an Aztec scripturu. During the liberal 19th century, when elite Mexican Creoles reduced indigenous lands to less than 1% of the national territory, the Guendalisa was again, once again reverted to Zapotec and Mixtec communities. It wasn't until 1932 that, the, that revolutionary indigenismo revised the Gay Laguetza, adding the 16 traditional dances to official festivities. It's at this point that the Gay Laguetza gift giving was also explicitly linked to regional productivity in keeping with the revolutionary state's developmentalist agenda. Each indigenous pueblo displayed their productivity, their agricultural contribution to the nation state. When Zapotec and Mixtec communities hold Gay Laguetza celebrations in California, New Jersey, and New York, they are reiterating Guendalisa as essence, as Zapotec and Mixtec kinship, community, aid, and obligation. The Gay Laguetza, however, is a reiteration of the revolutionary Me Mexizaje Indigenismo Dyad in the United States. It's the public performance of a particular kind of indigenous folkloric tradition in the interest of establishing indigenous continental priority, which is in turn invoked to create inclusion within U.S. nationalism. I'm not suggesting that Quendalisa would not exist if not for Mexican the Mexican revolutionary government's revival of the Gay Laguetza in the 1930s, but the meaning of Gay Laguetza exists in, the, in its aftermath enabling claims of transcontinental indigenous priority. Guendalisa establishes communal ties and commitments, but the public Gay Laguetza celebrations claim California, New Jersey, and New York for Zapotec and Mixtec indigenous peoples. These celebrations are an example of indigenism this, from below, and in, as indigenous migrants rescript the term the terms of revolutionary mestizaje from their position of indigenous priority. The Oaxacan Gay Laguetza showcases indigenous peoples performing their symbolic origins of the nation through their folkloric dances and elaborate handwoven embroidered trajes. However, it also showcased the literal fruits of indigenous labor, their agricultural production of the national diet. Piña, elote, chocolate, cacahuates, chayote, camote, tomate, aguacate. What do all these foods have in common? The ote and ate suffixes points us towards an answer, 
as they indicate Nahuatl words that transform the Spanish language through linguistic mestizaje. They are the foodstuffs developed by indigenous agricultural technology in the Mesoamerican cradle of civilization, the foodstuffs of every Mexican's daily diet, and of course, of our daily diet as well. We, we shouldn't forget vanilla, even though it doesn't have that suffix ending, but vanilla is also a technology invented uh, or developed by uh, this, the Mixtecs and Zapotecs. Mestizaje's extractive and appropriative logic thus reveals how shared, the shared culture that we call mestizo is profoundly indigenous. Mestizaje names a shared culture as mestizo when it is in fact largely based on indigenous knowledge production, food ways, cosmologies, medicine, ethics, modes of speech and address, modes of agricultural production, the engineering of biodiversity, because Mesoamerican biodiversity is a feat of indigenous engineering. The very Spanish vocabularies we use today vary widely depending on the specific indigenous languages spoken and indigenous technologies developed in the indigenous geographies claimed today by nation states. What one calls a tamal, never mind what's in it, or an avocado, depends entirely on whether Quechua, hybridized Spanish in the Andes, or Nahuatl and Maya, hybridized Spanish in Mesoamerica. So much of what we call mestizo in the Americas is thoroughly indigenous. Such a material and epistemic debt requires us to re-examine the nature and politics of the myths about indigenous elimination under white colonialism. Mestizaje challenges the Anglophone settler colonial model of destruction and replacement of indigenous peoples because in Latin America, Mestizaje enabled the inclusion and mining of indigenous knowledge, even as indigenous people themselves were devalued. Mestizaje names a set of specific alternatives, alternatives to settler dominance that, however paradoxically, created a space for the epistemic vitality of indigenous peoples who transgressed the enclosures of mestizo hybridity. Decolonizing indigenous knowledge production, indigenism from below, must be a priority in the 21st century. Mestizaje named and continues to name what is missing for Mexican and American and other biracial Latinx folks subjected to US jurisprudence. Over a hundred years of U.S. jurisprudence required Mexicans to emphatically renounce indigenous and African heritage. After the annexation of half of Mexico's territory in 1848, racist U.S. citizenship laws demanded that mestizo Mexicans disassociate themselves from indigenous Mexicans, regardless of kinship ties. If mestizo Mexicans wanted to keep their lands, keep the right to vote, serve on juries, etc. They had to go to city halls and courthouses to prove that they were white. What's more, indigenous pueblos recognized in the annexed territories were similarly required to sever kinship ties with mestizos in order to be properly Indian and maintain their lands in reservation status. And let us not forget that members of indigenous nations in the United States did not receive basic civil rights until 1824 a full hundred years after they received those rights in Mexico. The gravity of this historical loss of indigeneity cannot simply be discounted or dismissed. The influx of indigenous migrants over the last 30 years alerts me to another consequence of the US racial order, racial order of hypo descent. A significant percentage of the millions of Mexican immigrants in the United States over the long 20th century were indigenous, indigenous not mestizo. Most of these indigenous migrants inevitably gave up their indigenous attachments to become plain Mexican American under the cultural and legal duress of US hypo descent and racial citizenship, especially the criteria for Native American belonging. For these immigrants, indigenous ancestry may be no more than one generation removed. It's specific and ge geographically rooted but repressed because of the imperatives of US citizenship. This compelled loss of indigeneity for these immigrants is not an individual event, but part of an ongoing structure of racial citizenship. Moreover, this loss of indigenous identity isn't consigned to the past. 
Indigenous migrants to the U.S. are continuously coerced into losing connections to kin and land because they do not conform to the lit rules of U.S. Native American recognition. I do not, I have not had time yet to study the recently released census report, uh, 2020 census report in detail. However, certain statistics are relevant to this discussion. According to the 2020 census, 10.9 million foreign born Mexicans are living in the U.S. today. How many of these are indigenous? Correspondingly, the number of people living in the United States who claimed Native American heritage in the 2020 census increased by 86.5% since 2010. This startling growth suggests that the majority of those claiming indigenous status are indigenous immigrants. Part of us, our task as educators, especially in the Northeast Corridor that has become a magnet of Zapotec and Mixtec immigrants, is to ensure that their children and grandchildren continue to identify as indigenous, to speak their languages, practice their religious, re, indigenous religions and forms of government without pressure to become mestizos because it's just easier. I close with another example of indigenism from below. In 2018, the Los Angeles Public Library hosted the exhibit Visualizing Language Oaxaca in LA. The muralists, the Tlacolulocos, are a Zapotec collective from Tlacolula, Oaxaca, a town where Zapotecs make up 50% of the population, almost all of whom have relatives in Los Angeles. The murals commemorate the continuing kinship and proximity between Tlacolula and Los Angeles. As cultural critic Kat Ramirez summarizes, these murals dispel the myth that indigenous people are, quote, tethered to the past and to a single place, bringing into focus Oaxaca, California. These murals marry the traditional Zapotec trajes, jewelry, and embroidery, and architectural grecas that we see here on uh, this woman's face, with the Mexican graffiti fonts, tattoos, and even the gang sign for West LA. These murals challenge the US fantasy that Spanish colonialism in the Southwest consisted of a bunch of docile Indians under the tutelage of selfless priests. This is made evident in this prominent image here at the bottom, uh, in this prominent image of a conquistador's helmet shot through with indigenous arrows. One of the arrows affixes an image of Toy Purina, who you see here, the Tongva medicine woman who led a revolt against the Spanish Gabriel mission. The image Ramirez suggests is a recognition of, quote, Kuliana, the responsibility, authority, and right of indigenous immigrants to other peoples and the occupied lands they live on and work on, end quote. I interpreted Ramirez as meaning that Toy Purina's portrait is a visual in the mural, is a visual land acknowledgement, asking the Kongba, for, Tongva for permission to be in Los Angeles. However, immediately after this, Ramirez does a 180 degree turn, suggesting that the incorporation of this portrait is another form of indigenismo, a celebration of past and distant Indians, rather than reckoning with the presence of proximate and present Native American peoples, end quote. Ramirez concludes that the Tlacolu Locos and the Los Angeles Zapotecos who invited them were perpetrating, quote, contemporary cellular logics, end quote, because they were ultimately assimilating Zapotecs to U.S. multiculturalism as just another group of migrants at the expense of the Tongva and other U.S. Native Americans. Ramirez concludes that, quote, indigenous Mexicans are not exempt from perpetuating contemporary settler logics, end quote. Why are we compelling Zapotec and Mixtec Angelinos into the white settler colonial paradigm and U.S. racial logics when doing so reifies national borders set by imperialist countries and confirms their racial geographies? Instead, I suggest that we read these murals as the public expression of indigenous transcolonial belonging, an indigenism from below. This panel once again mixes motifs, the traditional um, uh, traje pants, uh, the huaraches, the machete, 
uh, with the Mexican American teardrop tattoo, uh, spider tattoo, and uh, dollar sign tattoos. Um, the young Zapotec, this young Zapotec gets La Pinta, La Nina, and La Santa Maria tattooed onto his chest with clouds in the form of the dialogue boxes you would find on Mesoamerican codexes, suggesting that even this act of colonial embodiment of wearing colonial history on the skin is mediated by indigenous authorial voice, and that these murals are a contemporary indigenous codex that makes this history of colonial coercion his own. In the next panel, the Zapotec traveler tucks, tucks this colonial history under his arm as he creates this hybrid geography of Tlacolula, Tlacula, LA, insisting indigenous migrants never forget the priority of their transcolonial belonging. It is we, the viewers, who must remember that this world, the American continent, has always been theirs and not ours. When will we start call, stop calling the last three decades of indigenous movement from south to north a crisis and recognize it as a hemispheric remapping of the American continent by indigenous peoples as a means of survivance and transcolonial becoming. Because it is we, after all, who must remember that this world, the American continent, has always been then theirs. Thank you. Uh, Wanishi, uh, thank you, Dr. Saldana Portillo. That was a very informative um, presentation. I have tons of notes of things I want to learn more about. Um, and it's such a story of resilience um, that I think all people can relate to. And it reminds us that, you know, we live in a society that has perpetuated these borders and separation, um, but that is, is not traditional. Our next panelist is... Uh, Ms. Carell Hall. Carell Hall is a PhD candidate in anthropology at Rutgers University. She received her bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College in anthropology with a minor in Native American studies. Her dissertation research explores embodied and distributed Lenape dis diasporic sovereignty in public and performative spaces. She has taught classes in both cultural and linguistic anthropology at Rutgers University and has presented her preliminary research at conferences and colloquialisms. As a member of the Nanticoke Indian tribe, she has represented her nation at numerous events as both a speaker and dancer. She is actively working on Nanticoke language revitalization, including a writing children's books and developing lessons for community classes. Using her experience and connection in the legal field, she assisted the Nanticoke tribe with ratifying their recognition in the state of Delaware. She continues to work as an activist and representative for her community, promoting visibility, decolonization, and education. Ms. Hall. When is she Trinity? We can all welcome Carell Delawans, Nantukoni. It's good to see you all. My name is Carell. I am Nana Koch and a PhD candidate at Rutgers University. Today, I'm going to share with you a bit about my research. Just going to start my screen share. All right, so the current title of my project is Distributed Sovereignties, Lenape Revitalization and Communicative Practices. My broad research question is, how is sovereignty exercised by a diaspora population who are not grounded in a collective place? How does sovereignty distributed through the people in these broadly dispersed communities become salient through their interactions rather than grounded in the land itself? And then lastly, how do diasporic peoples experience, negotiate, and practice sovereignty across different political formations types of colonial recognition, language varieties, and different material semiotic aspects of Lenape identity. Now, don't worry, I'm not gonna be discussing all of that today, 
But today I do want to focus on this last question and really explore some of the everyday ways that sovereignty is practiced by different Lenape communities. But first I'd like to ground us by going through a very brief history and geography of Lenape hoking. So on the left here, you'll see a pre-colonial map of traditional Lenape territory that's shaded in green. The different bands of green are representing the different languages or varieties of the Lenape language that are spoken in this area. So the lighter green in the top of the screen is the northern, the Muncie dialect. In the middle, you have a northern Yunami dialect, and then the dark green in the south is the southern Yunami dialect. And then on the right-hand side, we have the pre-colonial Nanakoke territory that's on the Delmarva Peninsula, clustered around the Nanakoke River and its tributaries. So starting in the mid to late 1700s, many Nanakoke and Lenape people were forced westward out of their homelands by colonial expansion. And this map is showing a detailed example of how they were forced west and where they ended up. The red markers on this map indicate where the communities that are recognized by the federal governments are today. So you'll see there's two markers in Oklahoma. There is one in Wisconsin, and there are two Lenape communities up in Ontario, Canada. The third marker up there represents the Lenape people who were removed to Six Nations. Um, there were also Nanakook people that were removed to that area as well. Um, some of you may know Six Nations as the Haudenosaunee people or the Iroquois people. So some people stayed in their homelands and organized into communities that are currently recognized by the states in which they reside. So in Delaware, there are two tribal communities that are recognized by the state, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware and the Nanakoke Indian tribe. And in New Jersey, there are three tribal communities that are recognized by the state, the Ramapo Lenape Indian Nation, the Powhatan Lenape Nation, and the Nanakoke Lenape Lenape Tribal Nation. And the Nanakoke Lenape Lenape Tribal Nation here in the South has a very strong kinship relationship with the two communities in Delaware. So what I mean by this is that although individuals may have um, a particular political affiliation with one of these communities, they have family members and ties in all of them. So then, how do these politically separate, geographically distanced communities practice Lenape sovereignty? What does being Lenape mean to these different communities, and what does it look like? So each of these communities have their own political governance, that's been shaped and or limited by the type of recognition that they have. So here I've listed the federally, the three federally recognized Lenape tribes in the United States, as well as the two communities that are recognized in Ontario, and also noting that there are Nanakook and Lenape people who are with Six Nations, as well as we have state recognized tribes in New Jersey and in Delaware. And in addition, there are numerous unrecognized Lenape people with various forms of political and social organization. So each of these different communities have their own orientations towards different aspects of Lenape identity. Um, some examples of this are there are different resources to, um, to archives for language revitalization, or the fact that certain communities are holding different ceremonies and songs. Um, there's also, they have different um, access to and residence in the homelands and access to ancestral sites, as well as these different access to treaty rights and NAGPRA claims. So these are just a few different examples. So then how do these different orientations to aspects of Lenape identity impact sovereignty? There isn't a single answer to this question. Rather, I want to see how Lenape people live, experience, and practice sovereignty in their lives and in, their, and in the interactions between different communities. So today I'm going to look at a couple examples of this by looking at aspirations of Lenape hoking. And what I mean by this is 
the way that Lenape people see, envision, aspire, and create Lenape Hoking. So first, before we do this, we want to look back at these pre-colonial maps to understand a little bit about the pre-colonial framings of Lenape sovereignty. So pre-colonial sovereignty for the Lenape was not based in the colonial frameworks that we often look at today with the United States or Canada or Mexico. The idea of a nation state with borders, bounded territories, with authority and citizenship being determined within these rigidly defined spaces. Lenape Hoking was not one single political nation, but made up of fluid sovereignties between communities connected by shared kinship, history, culture, territory, political affiliations, and language. And throughout the ongoing colonial period, these sovereignties have shifted and evolved to address the changing political situations. Today, Lenape Hoking is more geographically dispersed, but still operating on many of these same pre-colonial sovereignty ideologies of a Lenape identity held within the people and made visible through their communications and interactions whether they be collaborative or antagonistic. In some instances, communities will use the colonial tools of hierarchical federal and state recognition to divide and separate their Lenape identities, while others reject the authority of those classifications to determine their recognition and relationship with other Lenape communities. We can see in these different interactions, different aspirations of Lenape hoking who is part of it, and how these different communities will relate to each other. So one example of one of these aspirations of Lenape Hoking is visible in the United Lenape Nations powwow that was held in Manhattan in 2018. It was organized and attended by Lenape peoples from the US and Canada, from both federally and state recognized tribes. They came together to represent Lenape Hoking not as one political nation, but multiple nations, all Lenape, recognizing their shared history, language, and cultural affiliation, and finding ways to come together to strengthen their ties. Also in attendance were other federally and state recognized tribal nations, including the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations, as well as other indigenous peoples, such as the Taino from the Caribbean, and other allies, both native and non. They all came to dance in the Lenape homelands to forge a path together. This event, the participants, the location, their communications and interactions are all public affirmations of sovereignty. They were asserting their indigenous identities and specifically a multifaceted Lenape identity defined on their own terms rather than through colonial models of recognition, a declaration that we are still here and not relying on colonial governments to determine who we are and who we are to each other. Language revitalization is another form of sovereignty and also a Lenape hooking aspiration. So the Lenape languages are part of the broader Algonquin language family that stretches down the Eastern seaboard through the Great Lakes and across Canada. The Lenape are seen by many to be the grandfathers of Algonquin speaking people. The languages in this family are very similar, often mutually intelligible, and revitalization projects often spark old social, political, and linguistic connections that were previously disrupted by colonialism. So language revitalization itself then becomes an act of sovereignty. It is a way to reconnect with our ancestors and to reclaim our own traditional ways of speaking and the worldviews embedded in them, within them. It also becomes a tool to redefine the relationships our languages have to each other outside of colonial frameworks, as well as our social and political relationships with each other. One example would be Miss Nora Thompson-Dean, who was a knowledge carrier and elder from Oklahoma. She preserved and taught the Unami language, which is the Southern Lenape dialect, in her, in her home community in Oklahoma. But she also traveled to the Eastern Lenape communities, including the ones in New Jersey, to share the language and to fellowship with other Lenape communities. 
Language revitalization also includes confronting colonial ideologies about language itself. Some of these ideologies are listed here. So we have language and nationalism, the idea that distinct nations should have distinct and separate languages. Language standardization, which says that languages should have a recognizable homogenous standard. Language purism, which says that languages cannot have too many borrowed words and it rejects the idea of language shift or languages changing over time. And then wordism, the idea that language is primarily centered in words, in vocabulary and grammar and ignores all of the other ways that language functions. The different Lenape dialects are being taught in multiple Lenape communities and they decenter this language and nationalism ideology. Revitalization of many Algonquin languages means borrowing vocabularies and grammar from other similar languages within the family or using these similarities to reconstruct their own language forms. These projects are also decentering wordism and the idea that language is primarily about words. There are many other aspects of language that have been retained by communities, even after the words themselves have left. An example of this would be the way that people greet or depart from each other. In Lenape, the words to depart, Lepichkanaul, um, is it translates to, I'll see you later, or I'll see you again. And it's different from the finality of saying goodbye. And these patterns continue in English. So with English speaking Lenape people, even when they are not using the Lenape language in English, they will still choose to say, I'll see you later rather than goodbye, even though goodbye is you know, a standard way to depart for most English speaking people. And so they are, they are retaining this aspect of their Lenape language, even without the words itself. Another example of this would be in the use of kinship terms. In, um, many Lenape in many of the Lenape dialects, the words for siblings are the same as the words for cousins. And we see in, um, in English with, within the family structures, Lenape people still using those, the words for siblings and cousins very interchangeably, also sort of representing the ways in which different aspects of this language continue within the people, even beyond the actual words themselves. Another example of how these revitalization projects confront these ide ideologies is with the Nanakoke language revitalization. Nanakoke has no living first language speakers and hasn't for several generations. Their archives consist of a few vocabulary lists collected in the 1700s. Revitalization then seems daunting when Nanakoke is viewed as a separate isolated language and community and subject to these colonial language ideologies. But when we re-examine this project as part of the larger Lenape and Algonquian language revitalization movement, we can see how much we still have to work with. Nanakoke language revitalization relies on its relationships to the Lenape languages and to the broader Algonquian language family. They're able to share archival resources and rely on neighboring languages to borrow or reconstruct different parts of the language that were not captured in their own archives. Another example is with Munsee language revitalization, which is that Northern Lenape dialect. Munsee is being revitalized in multiple communities with language classes attended by Lenape people, both in the US and in Canada, in the Canadian communities from federally and state recognized communities as well. So we can see that the Lenape languages are not centered in single communities. These language projects that stretch across the diaspora highlight how Lenape people are striving to revive their languages on their own terms outside of colonial ideologies. Language revitalization thus expands the idea of how we see and understand sovereignty beyond imposed colonial models sovereignty that is both fluid and fractured, multidimensional, constantly shifting and made legible through communications between communities. So I thought I would end my presentation by sharing some of the language with you. 
I have listed a couple of words and phrases in both Nanakoke and Munsee to give you an example of how close these languages are. I know that you are all muted, but you can say the words after me and learn how to start a conversation in the traditional languages of this land. So in Nanakoke, if you'd like to ask, how are you? You would say, kola malis ha, kola malis ha. And in Munsee, if you would like to say the same thing, you could say, kiha kola malsi, kiha kola malsi. To say that I am well, I would respond in Nanakoke, no la malis, no la malis. And in Munsee, I would say, ni no la malsi, ni no la malsi. And then of course, gratitude is very important. And so to say thank you in Nanakoke, when is she? When is she? And in Munsee, it's Anushik, Anushik. So I'd like to say Wanishi and Anishik to all of you. Mechkish Aptone. Wanishi Karao, thank you for such an educational presentation. Sovereignty is such a loaded conversation, and you definitely um, planted some seeds in my mind of how it is defined in even more ways, particularly in language. So thank you so much. Our uh, next and final panelist is uh, Ryan Victor Pierce. Ryan Victor Pierce, or Apialanatek, is a member of the Nanticoke Lenai Lenape Tribal Nation of New Jersey. Upon graduating from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, Apialanatek has performed in workshops and productions at such renowned New York theatrical institutions as New Dramatic, La Mama ETC, and New York City Opera at Lincoln Center. In November of 2020, Apollonia Tech made history by giving the first ever Lenape land acknowledgement at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on NBC. In 2012, Apollonia Tech founded Eagle Project, a theater company dedicated to exploring the American Indian identity through the performing arts and our Native American heritage. You can check them out at www.eagleprojectarts.org. Through his leadership, Eagle Project has collaborated with and performed at the Public Theater, New Yorican Poets Cafe, and Ashtar Theater in Palestine. In April of 2020, Eagle Project collaborated with the American Indian Community House of New York City and First Nations Theater Guild to create Native Theater Thursdays a virtual reading series of new native work. Apollonia Tech will be entering the doctoral program for theater and performance studies at the University of New York Graduate Center in the fall of 2021. Wanishi uh, Trinity, thank you. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this esteemed panel. And you know, I would say that a lot of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is, is kind of a gathering of all the different uh, uh, information, both historical and present. Uh, and, and basically what I try to do is to combine all that, um, you know, mix it up and be creative with it in terms of creating uh, what, you know, many of us uh, colloquially call native theater. Uh, and native theater, which has a rich tradition, uh, both here in Lenape Hoking and around the United States. Uh, it's an ongoing tradition. Um, it's one that, uh, well, in terms of Native storytelling has been going on for centuries, but in terms of kind of um, infiltrating and uh, making the uh, colonial concept of theater our own, um, you know, generally goes back to about the 1970s, but um, has a rich tradition since, since then, um, and I believe has a growing and bright future ahead. So that is basically what I'm going to talk about uh, and, and my involvement and experience with that. Um, you know, I first want to start today uh, just by, uh, you know, kind of recapping some of the uh, horrible stereotypes that have been uh, associated with Native Americans uh, during, during the colonial period, and much of how Native theater is basically uh, a, a response to that and how to fight that. I mean, if you remember, you know, just going back to the 1940s and 50s in terms of, you know, you know Natives being portrayed 
uh, and stereotypes uh, by the you know, by the Walt Disney Company and you know things like Peter Pan or many of the westerns uh, which were shown uh, in the middle part of the 20th century um, and then you know continued to be shown uh, <laughs> in reruns on cable television today. Um, so there is much in show business and in the American theater of uh, of this you know stereotypical oftentimes based on planes what we consider uh, the plains natives uh, both the plains and and further out west and, and even then uh, many times it you know, was broken english it was specifically um you know they weren't they were viewed upon as either violent or or, or the savages quote unquote and and not uh, and not imbued with the humanity um wisdom and contribution great contribution and complex contribution uh, to the contemporary United States, uh, as as we know, um, and so basically, um, in the wake of the civil rights movement, um, which uh, you know we first started with African Americans in the mid 1960s, uh, came the the Native Civil Rights Movement in the late 60s and into the 1970s. Uh, it was around that time that uh, actually, uh, Hene, uh, well, in many cases, we uh, give a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Hene Gieguma, uh, who's uh, part uh, part Delaware or Lenape in part, um, Kiowa, uh, who's originally from Oklahoma, um, but started the Native American Ensemble um, in Lenape Hoking on the island of Manahata in New York City, uh, and it was hosted by La Mama Theater back in the early 1970s. And then with that ensemble, it was to show uh, Natives as a contemporary, uh, a contemporary living, breathing people with contemporary problems and issues, and to bring those to the forefront. And at that time, the Mama Theater and much of the off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway uh, community uh, was a place and a natural place uh, for uh, for Native theater and other theater that was viewed upon as the margins, you know, not not the uh, commercial theater that we mostly associate with Broadway, which is also a Lenape name, by the way, in case anyone doesn't know, uh, based on the Broadway, which is a Lenape uh, pathway that does um, cover the uh, well or bisects the entire island of Manhattan. Uh, from if anyone knows from Inwood Park down to down to the Battery, and so uh, Hane Gieguma uh, had the Native American Ensemble uh, through most of the 1970s, and in the late 1970s, another group, uh, a Native feminist group called Spider Woman Theater, also formed, which also had a home uh, in La Mama as well as the American Indian Community House in New York City, uh, which still exists uh, to this day. Um, and Spider Woman uh, is, uh, to my to my knowledge, um, the longest uh, running uh, feminist. A native theater company on Turtle Island. Um, and so, and basically, you know, also in that time, we've had a number of other uh, wonderful native playwrights and native companies, such as uh, Amarinda here in New York City, uh, Native Voices at the Autry in Los Angeles, California, New Native Theater with Rihanna Yazi in Minneapolis. And then also, um, I'll be talking about my company, Eagle Project, which uh, started in 2012. Um, basically, my company started, or, you know, well, there was a number of number of uh, instances and projects that were the inspiration for it. Um, but it kind of grew initially um, out of a workshop uh, called Carlisle, A Different Three Sisters, which was, in essence, an adaptation of, of the classic Chekhov play, Three Sisters, set in the Carlisle, uh, in a Carlisle boarding school in uh, central Pennsylvania, I guess, kind of like on, on you know, along the western edge of, of Lenape Hoking and around the turn of the 20th century, or around the time of World War I. And so basically it, it was about the, um, the natives coming to the boarding school, um, supposedly to be learning you know, certain trades, but then at the time of World War I, it became, um, according to the play anyway, um, the government changes it and basically trains them to go off to, uh, to fight a war. So, um, and you know, I thought that was such a, a, a marvelous and, um, and beautiful um, adaptation of, of taking a classic, theater play that almost all acting conservatories uh, around uh, around the uh, around every conservatory and basically taking a native story and and basically revolving um, revolving this classic play and making it uh, and, and making it native and 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 it's also a classic American story so um, so that inspired me to help start Eagle Project which uh, our mission is to explore the American identity through the performing arts and our Native American heritage so, so that we as Americans can have a more accurate recollection of our past, a better understanding of our present, 
for a just and more inclusive vision for our future. And so basically the, the workshopping of that, uh, which we had different um, different stage readings that were done uh, around New York City, one at La Mama, one at NYU. Um, it, you know, I said, you know, I want to continue this, and I want to continue trying to create a platform to develop and and ultimately produce um, various native plays and plays that really tell uh, American stories that all that are that are that are are so inherent in our culture, um, but not but not frequently told. Um, that base and basically our first our first presentation was by um, a tremendous native playwright. Uh, sometimes some of us call him the grandfather of native theater, who unfortunately just passed away earlier this summer. Uh, William S. Yellowrub Jr. A play of his uh, called Woodbones. Um, and if I wouldn't mind sharing that that first slide, uh, please. So so yes. Yeah, so um, in this picture uh, is a picture of our first production, Woodbones, which was done in 2013. Uh, produced by Eagle Project. Um, it was performed at the June Havoc Theater um, here in New York, or, or you know, in, on the west side of Manhattan. Um, and this picture right here is of, um, oh, uh, please, uh, please go back to the to the first picture, please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this picture is a picture of actor Abby Yabara in the role of Leroy uh, with abalone shell um, on, on the stage and as he is looking out. Um, essentially what Woodbones was, uh, it's, uh, very complex piece, but I'll try to I'll try to sum it up really quickly. In essence, it's the story of the spirit of the land that gets um, encased in this house, this kind of settler house, and basically is affected by all the different things that um, that enter this house. Um, both people that try to live there um, and then get cheated out of the house, a, a native family. Um, uh, family abuse or child abuse that happens within the house, and then ultimately these kind of capitalist slumlords that want to chop it up and divide up the house um, into into cheap uh, into cheap apartments, and all these things affect the spirit of the land that's encased in that house. And in this uh, um, in this part of the play, uh, the character of Leroy, who's a tribal elder, uh, uses the abalone shell in essence to try to help save the spirit of of help save the spirit and return the spirit and the land back to its natural state. And that, um, and that is kind of the essence and the beauty of um, uh, of, of Woodbones. Um, we um, we've had other obviously a number of other shows since then. And, uh, and if we go to slide two, please, um, right here, uh, this was a workshop uh, of a um, what we call the Trail of Tears, and um, it was we actually collaborated with the Norwegian Poets Cafe and um, at that time a theater company called Rebel, and um, Basically, it was a number, it, it, we call it Trail of Tears because I guess that was one of the most, you know, obviously the more well-known of the, of the um, native removals, um, you know, what we, you know, tip, what they typically call the five civilized tribes, which I'm sure is the subject matter for another whole, uh, <laughs> for another whole uh, seminar. But then let's, but we broadened it um, to include kind of the story of many other uh, native removals, um, including Lenape. And, um, and as one of the performers in there and one of the, and, and the artistic director of Eagle Project, um, there were testimonies uh, from, from my tribe, the Nanakokwai Lenape, many, many other tribal members and other tribal members of nations that were also uh, um, in the play, including, um, including Caddo, uh, including um, Biscataway Kanoi, um, and uh, in, including uh, Cherokee and uh, um, among others. Um, so it involved um, uh, it involved aspects of native language, of of of, of Lenape music. I included a Lenape song uh, within the play. So uh, in, in basically in terms of building on the discussions that were had earlier this afternoon in regards to native language, a big part of native theater. Uh, and part of my vision, I believe other other native artists uh, like me, is to as we continue to develop uh, or, or or you know kind of rediscover or resurrect uh, many of these native languages, is to use them, is to use them as much as we can in the native uh, work that we do, and uh, and and so as to make a native theater and indigenous culture or indigeneity uh, more uh, more of of a visual or visible. More of a visible part um, of, of what we, you know, of our American culture and American um, diaspora. So um, I'd like to move on to the to the next slide, please, slide three. 
Um, to that end, um, the um, you know my my personal uh, background is is predominantly as, as an actor um, as an actor and singer. However, um, you know, given that there there's not a lot of template around native theater, uh, I would you know many native artists would tell you that they also go into writing, into directing, into producing, um, you know, and uh, dramaturgy, you know. Uh, all the above, and and um, you know, it's in part because we have to. You know, there, there's not that kind of well entrenched um, theatrical uh, infrastructure uh, that exists for many other communities, uh, certainly Caucasian communities. So, so we have to, you know, we we have to, in some some cases, reinvent the wheel ourselves. Um, but still, though, ba hope you know, basing it in um, in the native stories and native values. Um, that uh, that's you know an inherent part of our culture. Um, here, what you see right here is a picture of a workshop of a play of the first play that I wrote actually um, called "This Play Is Native Made," and it was inspired by um, the real story and struggle of the state of New Jersey taking uh, and trying to remove the state recognition of its native tribes, including the one that I'm a, a proud member of, the Nanakoke Lane Lenape. And so basically um, the play opens um, with, uh, you know, a presentation, you know, being, being written by a native author and an officer, coming, an officer coming to shut down the play, basically saying that you can't say this is native, you have to be, you either have to change the name or, or you're going to be fined. And basically uh, a, um, a spirit of an elder coming to say, you know, you have to go through it, go through the story, you know, risk the fine, um, it'll come out better in the end, take the audience and the allies with you. And so we kind of go on an odyssey on the history of the Nanakoke uh, Lay Lenape uh, from the 1600s um, through, through the present. Um, it's, um, I think one of the fascinating ideas or ways of the play is that could be done, it can be done. It has been done uh, in so many different spaces. Um, right here, you're seeing a workshop that was done outside on Governor's Island. Um, uh, in New York Harbor, um, so we can actually use uh, the actual nature as part of our set, as as well as the um, as well as our own scene partners, and so that was um, that was a great experience. Um, if we can go on to uh, to the next slide, please. Here was actually uh, this play is native made has actually had uh, one full production, and uh, as I've said in some other uh, seminars too. Um, you know, it hasn't had a full production here on Turtle Island or in Lenape Hoking. I certainly hope that that changes, uh, you know, at some point in the near future, because um, we certainly want to bring it to, to bring it home. Uh, obviously, you know, home to our tribal nation, uh, but then also theaters, uh, well-resourced theaters in Lenape Hoking, both in the state of New Jersey, um, southern New York, east of Pennsylvania, Delaware, uh, you know, they... Um, you know, they have not, um, they have not really generally contributed uh, to the production of this. The first production of this play is Native May was actually done uh, with Ashtar Theater in Palestine, in Ramallah, Palestine. Um, and so we had a, um, it, it, <laughs> it was a whirlwind of a process in terms of, um, you know, over about a week's time, um, developing the play and getting it to a, a production, a production uh, phase. And we actually did it uh, in front of a local, local Palestinian audience. Um, uh, some, sp some spoke English, um, obviously, you know, many was not their second language. I mean, it was not their first language. And, and then, there, of course, there were some that didn't speak uh, English at all. But nonetheless, it was fascinating to see in that cultural exchange, um, the legacy of colonialism um, both, uh, both then and now, um, in Turtle Island, as well as, uh, in New Jersey, as well as, as in Palestine, in terms, and the audience, uh, participation, uh, both in booing the officer, both in cheering and, in, um, in rebelling against that and moving forward with the show, um, at that, you know, look, at that time in writing this, I was thinking of right here in Lenape Hoking in New Jersey and New York, um, and then, you know, doing it over in Ramallah, um, that actually is not an uncommon thing of, of government officials just blatantly shutting down a theatrical production. Um, so anyway, so I think that kind of, of um, uh, cultural, uh, cultural sharing and allyship um, was, 
was was truly a truly remarkable thing and something that we definitely hope to um continue uh, both in allies you know abroad and of course um of course here at home which i'll and i'll talk more about collaborations i've done here at home uh in in just a second um if we could please go to um to to the next slide please um uh here um so yeah so this um this is one of another one of the uh collaborations that we had this is actually the one uh collaboration with ashtar that actually uh predated um predated the when i went over there to this play is native made uh imana um the artistic director there came to came to Lanape Hoking, uh, came to New York, and uh, with a mixture here of, of Native performers and Middle Eastern uh, performers, uh, we did this kind of uh, a theater that was based on, um, based on the techniques of theater of the oppressed, uh, where basically we kind of devise, uh, devise a framework of a story, and then the audience that comes in there uh, participates in terms of uh, participating, suggesting endings. And we basically do different endings, different, you perform different endings to the piece um, that, um, that you created. Um, as you see with some of the Native performers, uh, in addition to myself, uh, there was also the uh, uh, Nipmuc performer, um, Kylie Turner from uh, uh, Massachusetts, uh, the Nipmuc Nation in Massachusetts, what is now Massachusetts, um, as well as um, Abby Abarigan, who's um, uh, Yaki uh, in Naki Nation in uh, Arizona and, and California. Um, and then going back again to the to the stereotypes and, and trying to break stereotypes, you know, as 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 I'm sure many of you seem to know that Native performers uh, come in, in very different shades, all different, uh, you know, we're just, you know, Turtle Island is a huge continent. And, um, and to, to, to say that uh, all Natives look the same is would be just absurd as saying, you know, uh, all Europeans or all Asians look the same. Uh, and that's again, fighting that kind of stereotype of, uh, of um, settler, settler colonialism. Um, so yeah, if we can we can uh, take the take the slides away for a second, please. Um, thank you very much uh, for <laughs> for uh, for for assisting uh, for assisting in this. Um, so many other in terms of the future, um, going back to collaborations, um, I, I think it is inherent uh, for for many native theaters uh, in terms of, to form alliances with with other with other native organizations, um, and and during the during the pandemic um, that has become uh, so crystal clear in the fact that as as I said in my bio we collaborated with the um, American Indian Community House. Um, and First Nations Theater Guild during the pandemic to create Native Theater Thursdays, which took a new Native play. And we worked with Native writers, you know, since it was virtual, we could work with Native artists from all across the continent, and we did. Um, you know, from Maine all the way to Alaska um, and uh, California, Mexico, we, um, you know, we did that, presented a new Native play for most um, Thursdays. Uh, at various, level, various levels of development uh, throughout the year of 2020 and into into early 2021, and now that there you know there now is that kind of hybrid of um, of you know still doing virtual performances as well as uh, doing in person performances. Um, we're continuing to uh, collaborate. Uh, there's a new Native organization, North American North American Indigenous Center, excuse me, uh, of New York. Um, and as well as well as uh, with some non-native theaters, non-native theaters as well, in terms of in terms of keeping to uh, to to produce our work. So um, so yeah, so that that's um, that's essentially it. Um, please visit. Um, if you'd like to learn more about us, please go to www.eagleprojectarts.org. And um, and Wanishi, I, I thank everyone for their time. Anishi. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I have had the honor of seeing some of Ryan's work and it is uh, moving and inspiring. So definitely check out the website. Um, I know that we only have a few minutes left and we certainly want to honor everyone's time, um, both the panelists and the participants. So I did take a, a moment to kind of look through the Q&A and I've kind of created a two-part question that each of you can maybe take a minute on um, to answer that I think kind of embodies the overlying theme of most of the questions. Um, so the first part of that question is um, what influenced how you define your own indigeneity um, through your uh, work or course of study? 
Um, and also many people were asking um, if you have any uh, resources you can point them to, to learn more about um, your topics on your presentation. And does anybody want to jump in? Uh, Corral, would you like to go first? Sure. So I think we were all waiting for you to call on somebody, maybe. <laughs> we're all been shy. Um, sure. So, you know, from my own personal, I guess, path, um, it's definitely not been a straight path for me as far as, um, you know, figuring out where my uh, research was going to go. But I was... Um, particularly interested in studying our language revitalization is what really got me started. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was able to um, see, I was able to connect with a lot of other Native students and see, you know, what their communities were doing as far as language revitalization. And I wanted to be able to um, bring some sort of, you know, some help to my community in getting that project started. And so I'm really happy to be working um, both on my dissertation on Nanakoke and Lenape sovereignty, but also taking a more active role in language revitalization itself. Right now we're writing a uh, children's book that will hopefully be available soon for distribution. So I'm really excited about that. Um, as far as places to um, uh, learn more about my work. I am writing my dissertation, so I do hope in a couple of years you guys will be able to read it and learn a lot more in detail about what my work is about. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Saldana Portillo? Hi. Um, well, um, the influence of my work is my mother is from Oaxaca and I visited Oaxaca, which is uh, one of the most indigenous states in Mexico uh, since birth, basically. So I very early on understood that indigeneity in Latin America, or at least in Mexico, is really the effect of, you know, uh, recognition by your pueblos uh, practicing uh, all of the reciprocity that's required by the internal governance of those communities. Uh, linguistic proficiency. So even though um, I come from a very pinto bean family, I knew I wasn't indigenous, even if, you know, some of my mother's family uh, obviously has indigenous ancestry. Um, because in Mexican terms, you have to be embraced by the community, you have to practice all of the cultural uh, requirements, and many of the stuff that both Ryan and, and Carol said. So I guess that's how I knew that I'm not one of those Mexicans that can claim indigenous ancestry. And, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was, I thought you were pausing for me. Go ahead, right? <laughs> um, no, well, first of all, I mean, I would say that a lot of, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the research and, and work that I put into, and in, into work, into the work that I've done has been talking to tribal elders, you know, such like as, as our tribal chief, Mark Gould, um, and uh, Pastor John Norwood, um, especially, I mean, you know, th those are the people that I would say I've, I've, you know, I've gone to the most in, in terms, in terms of the, um, in terms of the lifeblood and, and legacy and history of the, of the theatrical work um, that I do. Um, one thing in, in certainly in, in Native theater, you know, there isn't, there is not a lot of written material on, on Native theater. There, there are some, you know, academic journals here um, that are, we're starting to get more of, um, but I would say, you know, you want to probably look at, um, if you can find some of the plays of, of the late William L. Yellow Robe Jr. Uh, there are some plays also by, by Mary Catherine Nagel that are also being written um, and, uh, um, there was a fast horse. I would say um, there is there is one book that uh, was been published by Amarinda, which is a, um, a native company here in New York City, and that does kind of document some of the history of native theater during you know, during those early years that I talked about during the nineteen seventies and eighties. Um, I forget the exact. I don't know if it's off. I don't think it's called Off the Reservation. I, I forget, but but um, but that that is one. I can get back to the exact name of that. Uh, but that, that is the one, one of the one recent books that, that I, that I, that come to mind 
So you could probably maybe go online or, or and, and purchase. Anishi, thank you all. Um, I will turn this over to Miss Sarah. Thank you so much, Trinity, and to all of our speakers. Um, I, I know I, I speak for all of us. This was a terrific panel and we all learned a great deal. Thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom uh, and your talent with us this afternoon. And I wanna just invite all of, all of you to join us again for the next um, in our series. Uh, uh, and the topic of that will be Native American mascots, creating change in New Jersey. And we will hold that on Wednesday, September 15th, again at noon. Uh, and for additional programming notes, let me add that we have our annual New Jersey History Conference. The title this year is We're Still Here, Indigenous History and Persistence in New Jersey. On November 12th, it will be virtual on November 12th. And on November 13th, we are hoping that it will be <laughs> in person um, in New Jersey. Uh, that is our hope and expectation at this point, but we'll, we'll be offering programming both those days, no matter what. So information about both programs will be shared with you via email, along with a recording of this event. And we will be posting this event uh, on, on our YouTube channel and promoting it, uh, the recorded uh, uh, version of this event on our YouTube channel. We'll promote that through social media and our, on our website. So thank you everyone. We're delighted to have had you with us this afternoon. Join us again next month. Thanks.